Hello, hello, and welcome to our COP online evening service. So good that we get to be together. We get to study God's word. We get to worship him together. That's a good way to spend our evening. As always, we start with Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge. No evil shall be allowed to befall you, no plague come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder. The young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Amen. For our praise moment tonight, we are going to Psalm 150, the last of our Hallelujah Chorus Psalms in the book of Psalms. And of course, it is the last Psalm in the book of Psalm. Psalm 150 says, Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and the lyre. When you were in school, did you love prepositions? <laughs> did you love grammar classes and all those different parts of our language? But in this scripture, we have prepositions. And you know, sometimes in the Bible, I love the prepositions because they can tell us, they can teach us the theology of what's going on. Actually, they can tell a story. And we have lots of prepositions which are important in the Bible. Colossians 1.16, for example, For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers, rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. So sometimes these prepositions teach us our theology. John 3, 17, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. That is so important. Saved how? Saved through him. That tells you so much. Romans eleven thirty six for from him and through him and to him are all things to him be glory forever. Amen. So I love verses like that. Yes, that's preposition. And I guess it's a little grammatical. But these special little words do teach us our theology. How do things happen? Why do things happen? For what purpose are these things happening? Well, we have a lot of verses like that in the Psalms that teach us our theology of worship. But there is no other Psalm that has so many of these important ones than Psalm 150. Here we see twice in, and then we see twice for, and then we see six times with. So in, for, with. And those three, in, for, with, that translates very nicely into where, why, and how. In tells us our where we praise the Lord. For 
It teaches us our why we praise the Lord, our scope of praise, and how is our with. So in, for, and with, where, why, and how. It answers these prepositions. Who knew that prepositions were so important? <laughs> All this grammar lesson tonight, but that's okay. We have three really important ones in the book, in Psalm 150, in these little six verses, in, for, and with. In, where do we praise the Lord? This is establishing our theology of worship. Where worship is appropriate, is it only corporate or is it also individual as well? Is it reserved for heavenly beings or can we do it here on the earth? And the answer is, we praise him both here on earth and in the heavenly realms. Four. Now, does God give us a four? Does God give us a reason to praise or does he just say, I'm God, therefore praise me? God always gives us a for, a reason, a because. We don't praise in spite of our circumstances. We will praise God. God always gives us a for. He gives us so many reasons to praise him. You know, when people say, praise is a sacrifice. I'm suffering, but I will sacrifice and praise the Lord. It shows that they have no understanding of praise nor of the New Testament word sacrifice, because to praise the Lord is just natural for any believer. It's natural for any good-mannered person to say thank you when someone does something for you. Isn't that right? And it's also, this word sacrifice, it has to do with our New Testament priestly functions. One of our New Testament priestly sacrifices happens to be praise. We have other New Testament priestly sacrifices such as bringing offerings, doing good, sharing. We have offering ourselves, a living sacrifice. We have our New Testament sacrifices, one of which is praise. So it has to do with our New Testament royal priesthood, priestly duties. It has nothing to do with, it's hard to praise the Lord. If someone gave you a thousand pesos, would it be hard to say thank you? Of course not. You might say, why? <laughs> but if it's your birthday or something and they give you a thousand pesos, is it hard to say thank you? No, it's natural. You're a polite person. You would say, oh, thank you. You might even get a little excited and say, oh, thank you. <laughs> and so it is with our praise of the Lord. So it is with our worship of the Lord. So in, for, and our for, in this case, it's so broad. God says, praise him for who he is and what he does. That's very broad. <laughs> that gives us a, a wide spectrum of reasons to praise him. And then finally, the with, in, for, with, our where, why, and how. In, this, in these little verses, we have just a few verses here in this psalm, but we have six with. We have six examples of how to praise the Lord. So first of all, with every category of instrument, whether wind, percussion, string, every category of instrument is used. So we praise God with instruments. Then with, we see we praise God with the dance. Yes, God should be praised with the dance. And you know what? That doesn't just mean, oh, we'll have a ballet special number on Christmas Sunday. <laughs> That's not the extent of our praising God with the dance. Dance is a biblical expression of praise that should be implemented, carefully implemented, but implemented in all of our churches. <laughs> we should joyfully respond to the Lord. And then we see that we're praising God with loud cymbals and soft harps. We have different different, all different uh, volumes and expressions of praise. So we have a very broad spectrum when it comes to our in, we have a very broad spectrum when it comes to our for, and we have a very broad spectrum when it comes to our with. In other words, we should be praising the Lord, using every opportunity, every available means to us to praise our wonderful God. And next time you're reading your Bible, 
pay attention to these wonderful prepositions. They can tell stories and they can teach us our theology. They paint a picture that helps us see better and more clearly our life as a believer and as a praiser of God. Amen. So right now we are going to praise the Lord together in the earth, not in the heavens yet. We are going to praise him for he is so good to us. And we're going to praise him with our voices as we stand up and we worship the Lord together right now.
attention to the book of Romans tonight. We're in the middle of, for lack of a better term, what I call Paul's Proverbs, where Paul said, let's just get real. All right, let's just, let's just cut the phony baloney and let's just, let's just get real. Proverbs 12, beginning with verse 9. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, last night, we just talked about sincere love. We talked about all the love that the apostles had known and had been taught about by Jesus. They only knew sincere love. And we went through all of Jesus' teaching on that. But then in the Garden of Gethsemane, they, for the first time, were confronted with the mask of love as Judas walked up and betrayed Jesus with a kiss, a demonstration of love that was nothing but a mask. And after that, Paul, Peter, 
both very strongly teach about sincere love, love with no mask. Now I want to pick up from there tonight and look at the second phrase in verse 9. Hate what is evil, New International Version, New Living Translation. Hate what is wrong, Philip's Translation. Let us have a genuine break with evil and a real devotion to good. Now, as we start learning about being real and living life on purpose, I want us to talk about a true hatred of evil, having a genuine break with evil. Now, the Greek word is poneros, P-O-N-E-R-O-S. And all of the verses I'm going to use today use this Greek word poneros. So we're going to see that this is a very, very large word. Now, when the Bible says you are to hate what is poneros, what is it that we are to hate? Well, first of all, we have to define the word. The word refers to a spiritual condition that affects the entire world. Galatians chapter 1, verse 4, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present poneros age according to the will of God our Father. So it's a spiritual condition that affects the entire world. You say, well, pastor, what is it? Well, to define the word, we would say it is malignant because it grows, but it grows in a destructive way. It is degenerative and it is contagious. And it affects all of creation and is the source of all pain, toil, and destruction. Now let me give you that definition again. It is malignant, degenerative, contagious condition that affects all creation and is the source of all pain, all toil, and all destruction. Now let's begin to break this down a little bit. It is a malignant, degenerative condition. In other words, it only gets worse. Poneros never gets better. Poneros never fades away. Poneros is, is not a, a spiritual condition that you know you can just leave there and it'll even remain constant. Poneros is always malignant. It's always degenerative. It always gets worse. Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13, while evil men and impostors, Paneros men and impostors, will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Now, the thing that you have to understand about this, this evil, this, this Paneros, is it never just remains constant in a person's life. It is, there's nothing static about it. It's destructive, degenerative, and malignant at its core. I talked to the young man one time, and he asked me to pray for him. He said, you know, I, I have a problem. And I said, well, what's your problem? He said, well, I have a problem with lust. I said, well, let's sit down and spend some time together and get into the Word. I said, you know, let's get into the Word. You get washed by the cleansing of the water of the Word. So let's spend some time in the Word and spend some time with the Holy Ghost. He said, no, no, Pastor, I can handle it. I said, no, you can't. And I just looked him straight in the eye and said, no, you can't. This lust is only going to get worse. I sat down with a guy one time. He said, you know, Pastor Summerall, I don't understand the problem with drinking. You know, I, I, can, I can control it. Well, that was, what, 20 years ago now? Do you know how often he's been caught drunk now? I saw him not too long ago. He walked up and said, hi. I said, how you doing? He said, not very good, Pastor. I said, I heard. He said, yeah. He said, you know, you told me I couldn't control it. I said, yeah. Alcoholism, any type of sin, whether we're talking about drugs or alcohol or lust or pornography or stealing, whatever sin you want to mention, Paneros is degenerative. It's malignant. It always gets worse. Now, this is the reason why, why demons come in in degrees of evil, for lack of a better term. Matthew 12, verse 45. Then it goes, referring to a demon, 
and takes with it seven other spirits, more poneros, there's that word, wicked or evil, more poneros than itself, and they go in and live there. So there are demons, and even, even in demons, it is a constant degenerative process. Now, you, you, you've got to get a hold of this thing, because sometimes we think that a demon is a demon is a demon is a demon is a demon. No. No. There are demons that are more poneros than others because it is continuing to degenerate them. See, demons are in a slow process of degeneration. There is a malignancy called evil that has gotten a hold of a demon, an angel that has fallen. And it, it just it just keeps getting worse. You, know, you, you think that a, 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 the evil of a demon is static. No. Everything about evil is degenerative and malignant. I was talking with a man one time, and he had a, a secret sin in his life. And I told him, I said, you know, the problem with the secret sin is like every other sin, it grows. And right now, in your life, this secret sin is small. And you, you think you've got it compartmentalized, and you, you think that you can, you can handle it. And you can keep it secret. Your, your wife won't know. Your family won't know. Your children won't know. Your friends won't know. You've got this little secret here, and, and you've got it under control. You've got it compartmentalized. But you don't understand that every sin grows. Poneros grows. It's like a malignant tumor. It just, it just grows. And I've watched people that I have loved, and they wouldn't deal with that secret sin. And it, the problem is because it needs to be kept secret, they push people farther and farther away from them. They can't allow people in close. The sin requires secrecy, so they push people farther and farther away from themselves till they destroy their marriages and they destroy their families and they live this isolated life thinking that nobody knows when in actuality everybody's figured it out by now. Sin is degenerative. It's malignant. Now the second part about that definition of Paneros, it's contagious, okay? Once it comes into our life, it pollutes every aspect of our life. Matthew chapter 7. Matthew 7, beginning with verse 15. Jesus said, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing. They, they act just like a, a Christian. They act like a church member. But inwardly, they're ferocious wolves. Now notice, prophets, wolves, they function as a group. They function as a team. Okay. By their fruit, you shall recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree produces good fruit, but a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad paneros tree, a corrupted, diseased, malignant tree, cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you shall recognize them. Now, you're going to have to understand that once paneros, once evil gets into your life, it affects every aspect of your life, and what is seen is the fruit. Now, the, the trunk will still look okay, the branches will still look okay, and maybe even the leaves will look okay. But the fruit is the life that is coming out of that tree. Ah, now listen to me. The fruit is the reproduction. The fruit is the life coming out of that tree. And when you look at the fruit of a Christian who's filled their life with paneros. You know, the trunk may look all right. They may have a nice mask in place. But you don't see souls. You don't see generosity. You don't see helping the poor. Everything is for a show, but there's, there's no reality there. Now, brothers and sisters, it, it pollutes every aspect of your life. You say, well, all right, Pastor, how does paneros get into our life? How does evil get into us and begin to pollute us? Well, it enters through the eye gate, not the ear gate, not the nose gate. It enters through the eye gate. Luke chapter 11, verse 34. Your eye is the lamp of the body. When your eyes are good, your whole body is full of light. But when they are bad, when the eyes are poneros, 
and the eyes are evil. Your whole body is also full of darkness. Now, have you ever noticed people watching sin on television? It's like you walk through a shopping mall. Uh, I'll never forget walking through a shopping mall, and there was something on, on the, the video screens in front of one of the big uh, department places. And all these guys were up here at the old Robinsons, and they were like there were 20 or 25 guys standing there watching these girls in bikinis or whatever. And these guys were like, I mean, if somebody walked up and yelled fire, they wouldn't have heard it. It was just this streaming coming into their eyes. Their, their eyes were bad. Their eyes were poneros. And, and lust was just flowing in through their eyes. Luke chapter 11, verse 34, King James Version. The light of the body is the eye. Therefore, when thine eye is single, thy whole body is full of light. But when thy eye is evil, and thy eye is paneros, thy whole body is full of darkness. Matthew 6, verse 23. But if your eyes are poneros, if your eyes are evil, your whole body will be full of darkness. Why? Because that's what you've got coming in. That's what you're wanting to see. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness, Jesus said. Now, this, this, this evil is contagious. This evil is contagious, but it's going to come in through the eye gate. Now, once it comes in through the eye gate, it fills the heart. Now, this is how evil gets control of a person, okay? This, you, you say, all right, how, how did they, all of a sudden, their fruit, all of the fruit of their life is paneros. All of the fruit of their life is evil. It's, it's corrupted. How did that happen? Well, it started with the eyes, and then it came in through the eyes, and it filled their heart. Matthew 12, verse 35. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him. And the Paneros man, the evil man, brings Paneros, brings evil out of the out of the things of evil stored in him. Now let me read you a few more verses, then we'll talk about that. Matthew 15, verse 19. For out of the heart come Paneros thoughts, evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, and slander. Luke chapter 6, verse 45. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And the evil man brings poneros, brings evil things out of the poneros, evil, stored up in his heart. For out of the overflow of the heart, his mouth speaks. Now, once evil goes in through the eye gate, it fills up all the secret places of our heart. Now, we may put on a mask in front of everybody else. But secretly, this malignant, corruptive, spiritual disease called evil, again, this malignant, corruptive, spiritual disease called sin, called evil, is in our heart and it's growing. And out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth is going to speak it. Wow. Wow. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Out of the abundance of the heart, you're going to live it. Now, you, you may think you have this thing controlled in you. You may, you may think that, you know, you, you've got these, these secret thoughts down in your heart and you, you've got those secret thoughts under control. I'm sorry. It doesn't work like that. God needs to fix your heart. You, you keep that stuff down on your inside. Sooner or later, it's going to pop out of your mouth Sooner or later, it's going to pop out with the decision of lifestyle that you make. It stays there in your heart and grows until you begin to bear paneros. Matthew 7, 17. But a paneros tree produces paneros fruit. Sooner or later, the words, the life flowing out of you is going to be paneros. Now, I, I say this, please, without any condemnation or any putting down if you have been filling your heart because of what you're looking at that this is why guys you got to stay away from the pornography and girls too you gotta and then i never used to think that girls looked at pornography but i'm learning that girls do look at pornography too 
you got to stay away from that stuff. You start looking at that stuff and you don't understand. You have not taken food in that's going to be eliminated out through your bowels. You've not taken water in that's going to be eliminated out through your kidneys and your bladder. You've taken something into your heart. It's not like eating food. It's not like drinking water. You've taken something into your heart. And that thing is like a cancer that just begins to grow exponentially. And you don't even realize that it's growing until all of a sudden you say something or all of a sudden you do something. And you may even startle yourself. Ah. All of a sudden you make a decision. You go, man, why did I do that? Because of what's growing in you. Now, I'm going to teach you some more here in just a second, but let me just stop right here. If this is something that's going on in your heart, we're not people that have no hope. I mean, we have a God who, who fixes the hearts, remember? Now, if you let stuff come in through your eye gate, you know, and you, you just got to be careful with this stuff, folks. You know, you look at the murder, you know, you, you, young people, forgive me, but, but again, don't get mad at me, but, but just hear my heart. You know, if, if you're playing video games and all you're doing is murdering people all the time, you know, you're, you're putting murder in your heart. Some of you, you know, you're playing video games with anime. And you think, well, it's just a cartoon. Yeah, but the girls are still aren't dressed right. You're, you're seeing cartoon female bodies and you don't understand. You think it's harmless, but it's, it's planting something in your heart. Murder, adultery, sexual immorality. Please forgive me. You start watching, and don't get mad at me, but you start watching gay and lesbians on television for entertainment, and you think it's all funny, funny, ha-ha. You're putting something in your heart. You're always watching movies about stealing. You know, you're going to be, you know, Ocean's Eleven stealing one day. I mean, you're, you're, you're putting theft in your heart as a, as a cool thing. It's amazing how they make sin cool today. Have you noticed that? You start putting false testimony, listening to, listening to slander and lies about people all the time. Just, just filling your heart with, with the lies that people tell about people and slander that they say about other people. You're, you're putting stuff on the inside that's growing. Because remember, out of the heart come evil thoughts. What are those evil things that have been growing? Murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. All these things started with something that you were looking at. Something that you let fill into your soul. Fill into your heart. And you know, unlike bad food that you can vomit up, unlike bad sushi that might give you a bad case of diarrhea, but then it's gone, this is like taking a malignant spiritual cancer into your insides. And it's going to grow there until it destroys you. Say, all right, Pastor, what, what, what do I need to do? You need to ask God right now to fix your heart. Now, I'm going to teach you more in just a minute, but, but first, let's just pray. Now, if I've been talking to you, I want you to pray with me right now. Father, in Jesus' name, you know my heart. You know all the bad things I have put in my heart. I don't want them to grow, Lord. I want you to cleanse my heart. I want the blood of Jesus to cleanse my heart. I want you by the washing of the water of the word to cleanse my heart. Lord, take all those things out of my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Now here's something that my grandpa taught me as a young boy. When you get stuff in there that doesn't belong, Spend a lot of extra time reading the Bible. Or washed with the water of the Word. Spend a couple of extra hours a day. During your lunch hour, read the Bible. When you get home at night, read your Bible. Spend a few hours. You say, well, what passages should I read, Pastor? I'd just do the Gospels. I would just, maybe just sit down and say, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work with Jesus to fix my heart. I'm going to read the four Gospels this week. Ah, there we go. All right. What are the symptoms 
How do we recognize when we have filled our hearts with Paneros? Now, we know that the world is filled with it. 1 John chapter 5, verse 19. We know that we are the children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the Paneros one. King James says, the whole world lieth in wickedness. It's, it's under the control of the wicked one, of, of the Paneros one. Galatians chapter 1, verse 4. Who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present Paneros age. Everything about this age that we live in is Paneros. It's, it's, it's evil. Now, the symptoms are pretty clear. Checking my time to see how much time I still have to get through this. I'm going to deal with the first couple of symptoms, and we'll pick this up tomorrow night. How can you tell when Paneros has begun to fill your heart and this malignant cancer is growing there? Well, number one, we see the symptom of this degenerate disease in a person's speech. Matthew 5, verse 11. Blessed are those when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil paneros against you because of me. So paneros comes out of people's mouths. Matthew 5, verse 37. Sim and, and you just need to park on that one for a minute. When you, when you hear people speaking all kinds of paneros against other Christians, all kinds of evil against other Christians. Uh, it's a symptom what's in their hearts. Matthew 5, verse 37. Jesus said, simply let your yes be yes and your no be no. Anything beyond this comes from the paneros one, the evil one. Now, Jesus was doing a lot of teaching about taking oaths. Now, an oath is something that protects you from being questioned. Probably the most popular way of doing this today, of doing an oath, is to say, God said. God said I'm to do this. God spoke to me. God said. God spoke to me. Have you noticed how rarely you ever hear me use those phrases? In 41 years, have you ever noticed how rarely you ever hear me use those phrases? See, when you start saying, God spoke to me, or God said, People feel they can no longer question you. It's beyond debate. It's beyond discussion. God has spoken. Now Jesus said, when you start talking like that, when your yes is just not simply yes, and your no is not simply no, but God spoke to me, so no one can challenge you, no one can question you. That's a symptom of a heart full of evil. The second symptom is how a person thinks. So first is listen to their speech. Are they always speaking evil against others? Are they always using oaths to try to protect themselves? Then, okay, that's a symptom. Second is how does a person think? Psalms 36 verse 4. Even on his bed, he plots Paneros. He, he lays there in the bed and tries to think about Paneros, about forgive me, hurting other people, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, murder, theft, false testimony, slander, all, all these things that Jesus called evil, they lay there on their bed and they, they think about it. Matthew 9, verse 4, knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, why do you entertain Panero's thoughts, evil thoughts in your heart? Why, why do you entertain it? Why, why do you sit there and just entertain these thoughts and you know, entertain them, you enjoy them, so you're talking back and forth and you're bouncing these thoughts around in your head. Well, why do you do this? So you first look, listen to a person's speech. Are they always speaking evil of other people? Are they always taking oaths, using the name of God to protect them from being questioned or challenged? Then you, then you sit down and you begin to try to figure out what do they think about? What are they filling their thoughts with? And all you can do for that is, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. What are their actions? L look at their actions. Are they winning souls? No. Well, what are they doing? 
Are they doing the work of God? No. Well, what, what are they doing? When you start looking at what they're doing, what they're doing is sinful. They're, they're plotting evil. I'm going to give you one more. We see the symptoms of this degenerative, malignant disease called Paneros in their attitude toward Christ. John 7, verse 7. Jesus said, the world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify that what it does is evil. What it does is Paneros. Now, you'll even see this with Christians. They don't pray. They don't worship. You know, I walked into a church one time and there was a whole group of preachers. It was a conference. And I saw this one guy and he looked like a frog on a log. I mean, he just he just stood out. Like, which of these is not like the others? All these other guys were, they were singing that, that song, Jesus, name above all names. And all of these preachers were just lost in worship and their faces radiant in the presence of God. And this guy was just standing there with his hand in his pocket, just looking around. Which of these is not like the other? And it just, it just struck me. And I knew the guy. Well, we had a few days there. A couple of days later, we, we met, and we were talking, and he asked how I was doing. And then I looked up and I said, how are you doing? And I looked him straight in the eye and I said it. And he said, oh, summer all there's God showing you things again. I said, no, God didn't show me anything. I said, I saw you the other morning. We went upstairs and we sat in this little lounge and we spent the rest of the day talking. Man, he'd made a mess of his life. He had allowed that malignant thing to come into his heart. And it wasn't any longer just, you know, his thoughts and it wasn't any more just his speech. It had affected his relationship with Jesus. He said, you know, he said, I don't remember the last time I prayed. And he didn't say this belligerently. He said this with tears on his face. He said, I don't remember the last time I stood in a service and worshipped with my heart. He said, I've tried a couple of times just to put on a show. But he said, I haven't felt the presence in so long. And I sat down with him. And we just studied the word together and prayed together for a while. And I'm happy to tell you that God fixed his heart. You know, it had it had not gone so far as he'd done irreparable damage to his marriage or to the church or anything else. But the thing that I, I saw first was his walk with Jesus. You see, you don't want to hear what Jesus says when you've got a heart full of sin. When you've got this malignant Paneros growing in you, you, you don't want to hear what Jesus has to say. Because what he's telling you is that you're evil, okay? You've got this thing in you, and it's it's not comfortable. And so you start pushing Jesus away. He got himself back right with God. I called an old friend who was like a father to both of us in the faith and said, can you, can you spend some time with him? And so every week he would go over and spend some time with this older pastor. And this older pastor was really wise and really good. And you know what? The guy is serving God. His church is growing. His family's great. Everything's doing awesome in his life. But he had to stop it. Now again, I come back to you. We'll pick up some more of this, these symptoms tomorrow night. And I've gone really slow on this because I, I don't want you to feel like I'm bringing any condemnation because there is no condemnation in Christ. There's just hope in Jesus, all right? But if, if we've been talking about you, I led you in prayer earlier. I would simply beg of you, please, Spend time, get out the Gospels, and just maybe get on your knees. Find a private place and get out your Bible and get on your knees and start reading. And just say, Jesus, fix me. Jesus, fix my heart. Jesus, change my heart. Jesus, cleanse my heart. And Jesus, <laughs> he's a master heart fixer. Amen. All right. You've got you've to take responsibility for your own salvation. You've got to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It's time to get out of this entitlement mentality that everybody else is supposed to fix you. 
you and Jesus, you have a personal relationship with Jesus, you and Jesus sit down and fix this in Jesus' name. We'll see you tomorrow morning, 545 Daniel's Prayer, 6 a.m. morning devotions. Thank you for going online for tonight's evening service. We hope that you will join Pastors David and Beverly Somerl of the Cathedral of Praise Manila again tomorrow at 7 p.m. You may also join our daily devotions with Pastor David E. Somerl every Monday to Saturday at 6 a.m. You are also invited to attend any of the following services at any of the Cathedral of Praise campuses every Friday, 6.30 p.m., Saturday, 6 p.m., Sunday, 7.30 a.m., 10 a.m., 12.30 p.m., and 3 p.m. Our drive-in service is available for booking and happens every Saturday at 7.30 a.m. at our COP Main and South Campus parking lots. Fortress 91 is from Tuesday to Sunday from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. For more information and updates, visit us on facebook.com slash cop.manila.